check. Hi everyone, how are we doing? You guys have a good morning. Did somebody get some lunch, hopefully? Yeah? Awesome. Uh, it's amazing to see everyone here at Unite. I'm really excited to connect with everyone and tell you about Centis. Uh, so today we're going to talk about AI-driven gameplay and powered by Centis, our neural engine in Unity. My name is Bill Cullen. Nice to meet you all. I'm our principal product manager and I've been here at Unity for three and a half years. I have uh, worked in both our solutions group and our product development group. Uh, I'm focused on steering our AI portfolio with a focus on Centis, our neural engine. Uh, I've also got with me Alexander Ribard. He's a lead staff engineer and he's been at Unity for four years. He happens to be a world-class expert in machine learning. Uh, he's worked on uh, AI model inference at Unity for his entire time here. Uh, and we also have a special guest that I'll introduce a little bit later from one of our studio partners. So, today we are going to talk about the Centis product story. Why did we build this product? What can you do with it? And then we're going to show you five amazing demonstrations of using the tool. You got a preview of some of these in the keynote, and we're going to go much deeper into these demos and show you how they work. And at the end, we'll wrap up. Okay, so let's dive into why we built this problem and what it does. Let's start with the problem space. So there's two big ones. The first is that in games, there are some problems that are just really difficult to solve with traditional code. And we see AI models, and specifically neural networks, as a new tool to handle solving some of these tough problems in a new way. So for neural networks, you have some inputs, could be like a text string, video frames, sound, a myriad of, of input types. Uh, you feed these into a trained model, which can process the data and create some outputs. And the outputs can be the same data type um, or can be a different data type. Then the outputs can be mapped to a solution by a developer into your game. It's a really elegant problem solving technique, right? So the second is that just like the physics engine, sound tools, graphics tools, a myriad of other components in the game engine that we use to bring games to life, we want to be able to manipulate these AI models and neural networks in the game loop with fine precision. That's the key. And we believe that if we could do this, neural networks will be a very valuable new component in this kind of game development stack uh, and be useful in adding some new functionality to your games. But there are some challenges with solving these problems. Most neural networks are built and developed on cloud-based uh, architectures, you know, hitting, hitting big servers um, out in server farms. Um, and so bringing those down in, into the game loop like we want is pretty challenging. They're not designed to run on uh, small machines or mobile devices. Um, and most of them are often written in Python, uh, which is not run natively in Unity. So our R&D on this uh, set of problems began about five years ago, actually, a long time before the current um, AI craze, you might say. Um, we, we knew, though, that AI would be developing very rapidly um, and that some portion of new features developed in your games, you would need these AI models running inside the runtime. So the goal was to take innovations that were kind of happening at the time. Um, you see, like, uh, in university labs and corporate R&D, you know, publishing papers, and the next week there's a model based on the paper, taking that innovation and marrying it or fusing it with game development in Unity. Um, and then it could be available for any Unity creator. Uh, around this time, four or five years ago, we started seeing really exciting model advancements, things like language models that were really accurate, uh, object recognition for uh, recognizing real-world objects in AR, uh, automated game agents. All of these things were becoming very, very popular uh, and beginning to blossom. So we created this alpha product called Barracuda. Uh, maybe some people out here have played with Barracuda. Um, it enabled you to import and run a limited set of AI models, and you could use the end user device compute, the GPU or CPU, and it's up to the developer. You can, you can pick where you want to run the model, um, and there's no need for the cloud. So this kept it pretty simple. You know, you could manipulate the neural network um, down in Unity just like any other game asset. Um, and overall, it just proved that um, there were some developers out there interested in kind of playing with AI models in their game. Um, the interesting thing is I'll, I'll show a couple examples of what people did with Barracuda. 
Um, here's one called AIFI. This is a uh, tool in the Unity Asset Store uh, used to create a myriad of different game assets. One feature they have is a uh, image or a sprite upscaler. So you can go from like a 512 asset up to 2K, like magic. Um, and this would run on your PC. No cloud inference. Another example is uh, Bone Lab. Um, maybe you guys have seen this game out there. It's a pretty successful VR game on Steam and Quest. Uh, this is made by a studio called Stress Level Zero, and they trained a neural network in uh, Unity ML agents, machine learning agents, for the behavior of some interactive bird-like creatures uh, in their game, and it's been out there running for about a year. I think they launched in uh, September 2022. So some cool examples, but there were some pretty big limitations with Barracuda, and I'll, I'll run through a few of those. So only a few uh, model types were supported, which is a big limitation. So things like reinforcement learning models, uh, some image-based models. Um, usability was also a bit of an issue. The API was quite different from PyTorch, which is kind of the leading AI model development tool out there. Um, and lastly, performance uh, was a bit of an issue. Um, you know, there was some overhead uh, using the package, um, as well as just the architecture limited what our team could do for performance improvements. So based on this uh, kind of feedback from the alpha community that we're working with and some limitations we knew about, we just realized we needed to re-architect the product completely. So being software developers, sometimes we throw stuff in the trash, and that's what we did here a little bit. So we re-architected uh, the, the entire product, um, and we, we uh, gave it a fun new name, um, and so Centis was born. So we spent the last two years um, rebuilding Barracuda into Centis, um, and now we, are, we think we're actually pretty close to achieving this vision of fusing AI model uh, development and innovation with game development. Um, so now, uh, where are we at today? We can import most AI models. We can optimize them for all the kernels of the different Unity runtime platforms. And we can run them performantly inside the game loop, right? That was one of the key problems we wanted to solve. And there's no need for the complexity cost or network latency that comes with cloud inference. And with this updated code base using uh, burst compile jobs, model level optimization is much easier for our, for our dev team. Um, and we're actually seeing inferences in Centis running two times faster than Barracuda. So huge performance wins. And so now with Centis, uh, we're going big. We're offering it as the standard way to run AI models in Unity. Uh, we've been running a beta program since June of this year. Uh, hopefully some of you guys have tried it out. I saw some of you last night at the Heineken experience, drinking beer, so it was awesome to meet you guys in person. Um, and so let's take a look at how you implement Centis in your game. So step one, you get or train an AI model. This is kind of the most important part, where you start. So many models can be found in marketplaces like Hugging Face, or communities like TensorFlow. Um, you can also train your own model if you have some machine learning background. As long as the model can be converted to the open Onyx standard or, or file format, uh, you can import it uh, into Unity via Centis. So it's worth noting, a quick important point here, just like any other game asset that you bring in, right? you are responsible for where you source your assets from. Um, we believe that you know, models should be trained ethically with ethically sourced training data, and as creators, you need to be responsible for what you ship commercially, so keep that in mind. Okay, step two, import your model into Unity. This is really simple, you just drop it into the project assets folder in the editor. Um, Centis will automatically convert the model to an intermediary representation and automatically optimize the model too. Step three, you'll integrate and tune the model. So here, you're taking those inputs and outputs that I talked about earlier and hooking it up to your game code. So then you'll use, just like any other Unity asset, use the profiler and see if you're within budget. If you're taking too much budget, you might slice the model over uh, uh, many frames or explore some of the other performance tuning tools we have with Centis. Okay, last step. Uh, test and deploy your game. You do this pretty much as you normally would with, with any Unity game. Um, and you can deploy it on any Unity runtime platform that we support. So uh, the one nuance is that you have a couple of options for shipping your model in the game. So you can just ship it, in, uh, embed it in the game binary, 
or you can embed it um, as a streaming asset and uh, have it only downloaded when the player needs to access it. Um, and lastly, you might consider encrypting that model for security reasons, which we've got samples for in our docs, uh, along with the rest of this process. Okay, so that's how you implement CentIS in your game. That's the boring part. <laughs> so now we have this neural engine in Unity. Okay, what does that mean? What can you do with it? This is the fun part. All right, so our team is really excited to bring you five incredible demonstrations uh, to show you the wide-ranging uses for CentIS. Let's go. Okay, I mentioned Bone Lab earlier. I saw a couple of grunts that uh, people had tried the game, maybe. Um, it's a successful game on Steam and Quest. Um, it's been like the, the top list on Quest uh, most of last year, I think. Um, and it's made by Stress Level Zero, which is a studio out of Los Angeles. Um, the game is really unique. It takes place in this kind of underground research facility, and it takes you on this journey of challenging experiments and discoveries. And it has a really popular following for a couple of reasons. It has some amazing physics. Um, you, can, you can create mods for the game. There's like hundreds of, of mods and a whole community around that. Um, and it just has really wide-ranging gameplay. So definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. So Bone Lab has this scene where they wanted an interactive flock of bird-like enemies that attack the player. So a common approach here is based on this really old algorithm called BOIDS, which is Birdoids, if you haven't heard of it before, uh, by Craig Reynolds from the mid-'80s. So BOIDs are this classic example of like a really complex system that shows emergent behavior at scale. Uh, it's interesting because like the flocking is not really explicitly programmed into how they behave, but it emerges as a result of the interactions between the, the bird-like particles. So this, this uh, old and traditional simulation model scales actually really well to like thousands of BOIDs, even on low-end processors, but it lacks one key thing flexibility and efficiency to include interactive gameplay, right? And that's what players want, and that's what Bone Lab is all about. So using this traditional approach combined with these complex interactions, like you're, you know, in, in the scene, you'll see you have a sword and you're trying to swat the voids um, and colliders and particles, all this would add up to be very prohibitively CPU intensive. Uh, so you could run the same algorithm on the GPU, um, you could try that, and you'll get some gains, uh, but then you end up taking a bunch of the GPU budget, and obviously you don't want to upset your graphics engineer, bad things can happen. Uh, so, and even if it was running on the GPU, the individual boids would no longer be able to access the CPU systems that need to interact with them. So, this is the problem. How do you add interactivity to the, bo to the boids in a performant way? Well, this problem was ingeniously solved uh, using a trained neural network to create AI boids. So let's take a look at the experience they've built, and then we'll dive into how they did it. Okay, so this is the pillar climb scene where the player navigates through these fun, challenging moments of climbing and locomotion. At the top of the, pil the pillar, the player needs to defeat the ball that spawns these AI voids, and uh, the, the voids try to attack and thwart the player from completing the level. So let's turn the sound up and get the full effect. Okay, it looks awesome. Uh, the, the pillar climb where you're actually climbing up the ropes and kind of navigating, it's just a super unique experience. Check it out if you haven't seen it. So let's talk more about this solution. So what Stress Level Zero did here was they trained a reinforcement learning neural network model using our ML agents package, which is integrated with CentIS. So the solution takes kind of every creature's sensor data and solves for the next action all in one batch. And this uses the neural network outputs. And so this allows them to kind of physically position themselves instead of the much more resource intensive options of pick controller or interpolation. So here you can see a debug mode animating. 
So the red dots express the average neighbor position. The blue and purple spheres are kind of the space between which the Boyds are trained to fly. And uh, they're kind of trained to fly around the player at these defined distances, uh, attack the player, uh, avoid collisions. And then the, the behavior is reinforced through the model with rewards. And these are similar to this old traditional Boyd's model of uh, cohesion, separation, and alignment. And then there are some penalties for flying into geometry or flying outside of the boundary radius. So these, these Boyd's, though, are, are digital creatures uh, driven by the neural network. And reinforcement learning allows them to express emergent behavior, like I mentioned earlier. So occasionally, you'll notice they kind of fly outside the boundary radius with their kind of unscripted flying behavior. So this solution keeps all the data on the CPU rather than bouncing back and forth between the GPU and CPU processors, um, uh, like an alternative compute shader approach would. So this model takes in many inputs. It takes in the position and rotation of the creatures, the distance from the destination, raycast, obstacle avoidance, uh, and the neighboring void data. And then the model will process all that data and output four values for uh, pitch, roll, yaw, and acceleration, uh, which the AI voids then fly accordingly. So what's great is this neural network is, is really small. It's only a third of a megabyte in size, so no problem to ship this in their runtime game. Um, and, and distribute it really easily. Um, they actually originally implemented this in Barracuda uh, last year when they launched, um, but they've now transitioned to Centis in an unreleased version, um, and it's running uh, 2x faster. So this is going to leave a lot more budget for more AI voids uh, or better graphics in the scene, whatever they want to do with the budget. Um, they're able to fit this inference in their really, really tiny perf budget, thanks to Centis being able to fine-tune the network um, uh, down in the game loop. So what they do is they split the execution of the inference over many frames. So they, the total inference is three milliseconds, and then they split this or slice it over 10 frames, uh, and they get a 0.3 millisecond per frame execution. And at the end of the day, it leads to uh, ma maintaining their really high target frame rate of 90 frames a second, which, again, you put the headset on, it looks really kick-ass. So <laughs> we don't want to degrade that. Um, OK, so we saw this great experience with uh, 10 fully interactive AI voids in the game. But what about more? So here's a prototype showing scaling up to 100 interactive AI voids. Looks really cool. I don't think I want to fight those at the top of the pillar climb scene, though. I don't think I could kill them all. I need like a longer sword. <laughs> so in working with Stress Level Zero, um, we, we learned that they have this amazing game and a business with Bone Lab, and they don't want to take some big risks that's going to disrupt the player experience. So they did this kind of as, as a test, but they proved out that they could train their own network with ML agents and run it locally in the runtime with Centis. Um, and, and now they can just safely imagine, hey, we, you know, we can do this with a lot more features going forward and adopt this, uh, this tech in, in more games in the future. So if you're a fan of the studio, uh, you might expect to see some more nuanced agents with lifelike behaviors and things like that uh, in the future games. Um, as I said, this, this feature um, is currently live on the old Barracuda um, in the live version of the game, but they plan to ship the uh, Synthesis-based upgrade in 2024. Uh, really amazing job by this studio with the unique game experience. Um, and it's really awesome for our team to see this kind of transition from the kind of old first version alpha product to you know, what we're going mainstream now with, with Centis. So we really appreciate that. OK, let's take a look at another great use case of the Neural Engine. So Trip is another Los Angeles-based uh, studio. Um, they are a wellness company with an award-winning cross-platform app. And I'd like to invite a uh, good friend and colleague of mine, uh, David Swars, who's head of research and development at TRIP, to the stage to talk about their integration with Centis. Welcome, David. Come on up. Thank you very much. Awesome. Testing, one, two, three. Hello. Can you guys hear me? My turn? OK, all right. Um, I assure you, the height difference is a neural network casting an optical illusion. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're in the middle of the session. Um, some of you are hungover, some of you are <laughs> jet lag, post lunch. I will not blame you if you fall asleep. Um, but let's let's do a just quick exercise. 
Let's take a deep breath, deep collective breath. Four counts, okay. Awesome, thank you so much. So, uh, clicker, okay, trip. Trip's more than just a meditation app. Um, at Trip, we're trying to build tools that empower the user in their well-being journey. The um, with using Unity, we've we've built a highly scalable solution, a set of solutions or a set of applications uh, across a myriad of. Uh, mixed reality and mobile devices, including the MetaQuest, the PSVR 2, iOS, and Android. Today, we're going to be talking f strictly focusing on something that we've been working on, the Trip VR uh, product, which allows users to immerse themselves in meaningful mindfulness experiences. So, a core feature of our of, of the trip VR app is the visualization of of breathing during our breathing exercises um, we do this by uh, casting inhale and exhale particles there's particle effects uh, on a animation loop as some of you may know breathing is a very powerful tool in mindfulness practice so this has been a very well received feature However, it can be better. Like I said, it's a loop. It's, a just, it's an animation, so it's not personalized to the user's breathing. And this was a very requested feature. We would see it on the reviews. We love your particle effects. They bring me into the experience, but it's not my breath. So we wanted to change that. So let's just dive right into it. This is it. So our breath feature will enhance the app by the visualization of the user's breathing. It does this by looking at the headset motion and understanding what breath patterns are like. We'll get into more detail in just a minute. But as you can see, the, we're, we're taking the breathing and we're changing the environment in accordance, in synchronization with, this, uh, with, with their breathing. So the particles glow, the rocks lift, kind of like a Jedi meditation uh, exercise. Um, uh, the rocks glow as well. It's closing that loop on that biofeedback of their breathing. And as they progress through their session, the rocks finally you know, assemble into, a, into a, a, what we call a reward, a closing reward. With this type of experience, this is how we're trying to how we're trying to innovate, bringing, taking every kind of meaningful physiological signal for in mindfulness, and layering experiences on top of it. All right, so how do we do this? There's there's no real breath sensor that you can buy. Okay, that's not true. <laughs> There, there, are, there are, they're called spirometers. Some of you may, may have seen one or used one before. They are, they're, they're basically masks that you put on your face. There is no way in hell that we're going to ask a user to buy an expensive device, put it on their face, then buy another expensive device, and also put it on their face just to power our experience. So we needed to make this work with sensors that were already available on the headset. Fortunately, there is a rich history of deriving information from motion, and there is one sensor that is guaranteed to be available on all mixed reality headsets to power their tracking capabilities, which is the inertial measurement uh, unit, the IMU, the headset kinematics. So we took a, a series of stacked filters to isolate the breath motion from uh, the noisy head movement data and fed these as inputs to a time series classification network and architecture that we developed in-house. Using these two things, the breath motion, so how deep or forcefully you're breathing, and the inhale, exhale, or hold state, we're able to power different parts of our, uh, of our game state. Uh, you saw in levitating, in what we call levitating rocks, the rocks lift, the rocks glow. We have several other experiences that use these values 
in slightly different ways. And we're, we have several more in the pipeline, and that's how we're, you know, we're, we're innovating with this feature. So the question is going to be, why CentOS? Um, in order to accomplish this, we had a couple of solutions. Build a fairly complex signal processing chain ourselves, which we tried to do. It's hard. Um, leverage a neural network model, which was a solution that we did, and we deployed this on the Onyx runtime. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that inference framework, but it's the, the de facto inference framework for, for running uh, models. We hit a very quick snag, which was that Onyx runtime does not support and has no plans of supporting several platforms that we rely on. So that meant no PSVR, no PSVR 2, forget about uh, the Apple Vision Pro. So we needed another solution, and we started tinkering with Barracuda. Barracuda was great. It was great. <laughs> but it had, it had a couple of issues, performance and ML operators-wise. So we were really excited when Centus came along, and we saw that it worked great, um, performance was great, and it supported our model. Um, and, and that's, you know, that it's uh, what we use now to, to hit the, you know, performance targets that, that we require to power the feature. Um, it's shippable, it, it's guaranteed to run on all the Unity runtime. So, uh, so we're very excited to, to be able to deploy it there. And, uh, and thank you guys, right, for, you know, for working with us. So, um, there's a beta, uh, that is ongoing right now. I invite all of you, if you have the trip application, you just haven't used it in a while, um, give it another give it another try. See what you think. See you know, drop us some feedback. I, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, we have plans to integrate some other uh, physiological like biosignals and just continue working on that um, uh, on Centus and. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Thank you for <laughs> giving me your attention. Um, I would like to introduce the very talented Alexander Ribard onto the stage to talk to you about the other demonstrations. Woo! All right. Awesome. Thank you, David. That was great, right? Yeah. All right. Who wants to see more demos? <laughs> Woo! -woo! All right. So the project I'm going to show you is called Muscle Vision. So it's made by an indie dev called Julian NG Fuhang from San Francisco, California. And um, he's been collaborating with Dr. Antoine Felice from the neural, it's a hard word, the Neural Biomuscular Lab at Sanford. And um, the lab is really focused on, on, uh, on studying human motion and tying that with technology. And they really have some of the top doctors, physicians, and technicians there. So Julian, what he wanted to do is he wanted to, he wanted to solve the, the real problem of, um, of finding a better way of how a patient could follow the physical therapy requirements that doctor gave them to follow. So usually, you would go to your doctor, your doctor would tell you, okay, you need to do this amount of uh, reps at home, and then you go home, print some PDF or watch YouTube videos and do your best to follow the physical therapy movements. But could you do better? You know, ideally, you don't want any additional equipment. You don't want to put any additional equipment on you, and you want to do that at home. So could you do that? So this is what he did. So you can see Julian here, and he's doing a number of physical therapy exercises. So he's doing some leg raise, some, um, some lunges, and some squats. You can see that the, the app, okay, let me go at the beginning, that was fast. Yeah, so you can see him doing a number of physical therapies. So he's doing his squats, and as he's doing his squat, you can notice on the, on the picture on the right that the different muscle activations are being triggered based on, based on his movements. So the more red it is, the more active the, uh, the muscle is. So now he's going to add the, the rep counter. So he selects a, a, a certain movement and performs the reps. If he doesn't do it correctly, the rep is not counted. So you can see at the beginning, he did it incorrectly, and the rep was not counted. If he does it correctly, that means the correct mu uh, muscle activation are correctly activated, then you can increment the, the rep. And that means you're following your physical therapy exercises, and you're doing what your doctor told you to do. 
So you can see that the movements are validated in real time, and he's doing that at home in a relaxing home environment. So really, this, um, this problem of tracking body orientation and muscle activation over time, simply you cannot, you cannot solve it with traditional programming. But of course, by now you probably guessed it, you can solve it with a neural network. And that's what exactly what, uh, what, what Julian did. So if you were to, to first try to tackle that uh, with traditional code, it would be very labor intensive. You would have a lot of heuristics, maybe a decision tree process, and uh, you, you would need to fine tune very specifically to your poses. Instead, what Julian did is he worked at the guys at Sanford and used their software called OpenSim to generate training data for his LSCM neural network. After training, the network is able to detect over 80 a muscle activation for the lower part of the, of the body. Then um, the app has an augmented reality view on iPad using uh, Unity AR Foundation. So the, the network analyzes uh, body to pose uh, from, the, from, the, um, from the device video, st video stream and is able to detect the key muscles that are activated and validate it against the, the, the physical therapy requirements. That's pretty easy because since you know which muscle are activated, you can just check are you, you know, is the right muscles being activated or not. So then you can validate that you're following what the, the doctor prescribed. So the model is, is super tiny. It's one megabyte in size. So really there's no problem shipping that in your game. The inference time is around 16 milliseconds on an iPad Pro resulting in a very smooth 60 FPS experience. So hopefully you found this project interesting, but what really, uh, more than the tech, what really impressed us is when we, re re when we realized that Julian was actually a high, a high school senior. He's actually 17 year old and he's doing that on his spare time and he started doing this as a literal science project. So he's super passionate about it and he plans to, uh, to, 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 to work more on his app and polish the experience and finally uh, eventually commercialize it on the App Store. So in the future, he really wants to, uh, to keep polishing this experience and of course add all the upper body muscle activations. And uh, his long-term vision really is to improve, um, to improve outcomes in physical therapy by making nuanced health training accessible to, uh, to a wide range of people. All right, so by now you're seeing that there's a number of problems that can be solved with neural networks. Um, so the use cases really span every single AI model that you could find. But let's dive back in, let's, dive, let's take a step back, dive back in, into games and look at something more complex. So have you, ever want, have you ever wanted to have a full conversation with an NPC, but found you frustrated with the traditional, the lack of, the lack of flexibility with traditional um, in-game dialogues? So the conversational stack that we're building on top of Sentis addresses exactly that. And allows the user to create immersive speech-based interaction with any character. So let's say you want to build a futuristic taxi cab scene. It's an unscripted, unfiltered, open-ended dialogue system between the player and this robot taxi. It needs to have open-ended quest, and the dialogue needs to feel natural. So typically, how you would approach this is you would have a dialogue tree, and you would have your dialogue tree, and then the player interaction would need to follow that tightly scripted dialogue tree, and the player answers also needs to fit in that tree. But with neural networks, we can, that, we can make that experience more immersive and more believable. So before we dig into the detail, I, wanted to, I want to show you the experience so you can take a look at it. So the demo is created by our team at Unity and uses some of the mega city assets that you've probably seen on the expo floor. Good evening. Welcome to the pulsing heart of Yenova. Where are you headed? To the police station, please. Certainly. What's the reason for your visit? It's official business. Understood. Rumor has it there were some disturbances in the vicinity recently. I'm aware. 
but I can't talk about it. It's confidential. Got it. We, robot taxis, are programmed to be curious beings. Actually, could I see your taxi log? It may have some info I'm looking for. Sorry, I'm obligated to protect customer data. I understand, but I have the authority to do so. Acknowledged. Access granted. What details from the log would you like to access? This man might be linked to recent events. Recognize him? Allow me a moment to cross-reference with our taxi database. Indeed. One of our units recently transported him to a nearby club, the Luminous Lair. Hmm, okay. Change our destination then. Head there fast. Route set for Luminous Lair. We'll be there in no time. That was cool, right? So there was no bubble selection dialogue tree that you needed to select what you're going to say to the, to the NPC. It's totally unscripted. You talk to the NPC, the NPC answers. If it so happens to be that you're talking about the correct quest line and you're talking about the correct thing we've, we've scripted, we trigger the next quest. So what we, what we have here really is, is a tool that you can say anything to an NPC. And then, and then as a developer, you can use those series of tools to really um, do what you want with it. So you could trigger different quest lines. You could. Um, let the, the NPC talk or uh, trigger anything you want in the game. And really, what this introduces is a nice illusion of choice for the player. So the solution here has a few moving parts and uh, um, leverages out four models to do different things. The output of each model is chained to, to the other one, and this is made possible by sentence. So first is the voice input. So we wanted this to be as natural as possible. So the player simply talks in their microphone. Then we use a text-to-speech model to do the transcription. Then the logic of the dialogue system is still handwritten, but what makes the demo magical is really the, the sentence embedding model. So what that model allows us to do is to text, take the text input and to map that semantically to what, we have, to what we have in our database. database. So we're able to map the semantic meaning of the, of the input of the character to something else. So if the player talks about... Um, talks about going to the police station, we know that he's mentioning the police station, and then we can trigger the quest that we have in our database that is relating to the police station. Um, and then, once we do that, we can, we can uh, decide which path is picked for the player, given how the dialogue aligns with the gameplay options. Really, we have agency over the output, so we can trigger quest line, um, we can have handwritten answer, of course, or use a large language model to generate unscripted and realistic non-repetitive answer from the NPC. In our, in our case, the, the user, the, in our case, the NPC's answers are generated by a large language model, which we carefully constrain to make sure that we get realistic um, and appropriate text response. Finally, the, the output text string is converted to speech using a text-to-speech model. So there is um, so all the models are running locally in the demo. So that that is really the fact that the the reason why this demo is so smooth and and, uh, and interactive. But there are some cases where you might not want to have your model on disk. So in in the demo, for example, uh, the large language model is eight gigabytes. So I know that games these days are around 100 megabytes, and it takes hours to download them. So you could fit it, but you know you might not want to. Uh, in this case, you know, you can put it on the cloud and still do a server call. Uh, also, you could also be querying uh, different APIs uh, to that provide um, AI services. So in our cases, we use a replica to do the text-to-speech. So for those both use cases, uh, you'll want to look for our Centis HTTP wrapper, which allows you to do this without changing any of your C-sharp code. All right, so let's take a look at the performance of, of the model. So uh, all this is running locally on a, on a PC, and overall, the total inference round trip is around one second. So 
of course, the, the inference time really depends on, um, on the sequence length and depends on how, you know, how much text the, the AI needs to, to respond and what's the, what's the input. But it's still, it's still reasonable. The cool thing is that each, each of these different parts uh, individually can, can very well ship in any, any, uh, any runtime game. Um, yeah. So we initially began building this demo to showcase uh, unscripted MPC and multi-inference solution. But at the end, what we got was a series of tools which, um, which were quite practical in streamlining and simplifying the difficult task of managing an open-ended dialogue system. So really, we're thinking of how, um, of how we can make this collection of tools more available to the Unity um, user base. Uh, it really speaks to how neural networks can simplify the very tedious and challenging task, and it allows you, as a developer, to really focus on what's important, which is crafting an um, uh, immersive gameplay experience. So, so far, we've looked at four incredible ways that Sentis allows you to infuse your, your Unity apps and games with AI. So let's take a look at the final demo. So graphics rendering is at the core of the game engine. It really underscores everything we do. So the last demo shows a glimpse of the future with neural rendering powered by Sentis. So this demo is made by an indie dev developer named Amratikan Madvedan, or Ray. He's from India. And he likes, uh, he likes he, he's from India, and he works for a small game studio and did this on his spare time while experimenting with AI, like I'm sure a lot of you are doing right now. So he was looking at a, at a way to uh, achieve performance, path quality, dynamic light maps on mobile. But as you may know, shading effects like refractions, caustics, and aerialize tend to be very process of ten, tend to be very process intensive, even on high-end GPUs. So here was, here's what it looks like. So you have the classic game Pong. The objects are rasterized, but there's no actual lighting calculation going on. Instead of a pixel shader, the network hallucinates the final pixel. So this is running on a Samsung Android phone, and for every point score, he showcases a different, a different environment. This really is the first Unity game we've seen that uses this approach, and the entire rendering is powered by uh, neural rendering. So how did he do it? Well, you probably guessed it, well, a neural network. So here, the, the trick of this demo really is understanding the problem space and knowing how to smartly apply a neural network. So let's break it down. The first thing to note is that this is a very simple game. Right? The, the camera is static, there's only a few objects in the scene, and they move in a really constrained way. So the ball actually can only move on the XY plane, and the paddles can also only move up and down. The real complicated thing is the lighting. So giving a combination set of object position, what Ray wanted was an efficient way to compute the final lighting. This actually maps very well to a simple supervised learning problem, and that's exactly how Ray tackled it. So he first renders the game, the, all the possible game state in Blender using path tracing. And, um, so he renders all the possible game state with path tracing, and then he trains a generated network to map the object position to the final lighting on each object. Once the training has converged, he can go back into Unity. At runtime, he feeds the model with the current object position in the scene, and then he can recall the pre baked lighting on the object's texture. That way, he can shade all the object without needing to perform any area lighting calculation, or any shadows, or all the traditional shading pipeline. The great thing that this is the data for the model is self-created by the developer, and the model doesn't require that much data to, and train very quickly. Each, each scene uses one model per object, and the points, the points are UI element rendered on top. So you could really imagine this, this technique to work alongside traditional rendering pipeline, where you save it for dynamic light maps or really expensive of, uh, objects with expensive lighting effects. So the total build size for this app is around 450 megabytes, and is comprised of a few parts. So each model is 16 megabytes times each object, the paddles, the ball, the lights, and the wall, times five scenes, which change every time a player scores. On a Samsung Galaxy S21, 
The inference time is 28 milliseconds, resulting in a 30 FPS experience. So he tried this on Barracuda a while back, but could only achieve 4 FPS. So he found, like, like a lot of people, that Sentis is significantly better in terms of performance and convenience. So Ray really wants to release this as a free-to-play game on iOS in the near future to show what is possible with neural rendering. So yeah, uh, that was a really great demo. Uh, and uh, let's finish it off. All right, so I think we're out of time. I'm sorry it took a little bit too long. So uh, I think I'll quickly wrap up and then go to, uh, to Q&A. So uh, just to recap a bit, this, let's review what Sentence enables you to do. So first, you can build things and solve problems with AI models that traditional code cannot. Second, since you're leveraging out local inference, that means you can eliminate network latency. And you have unlimited free use. And there's no data sent to the cloud, so everything is fully private. Thirdly, Sentis is the easiest and most standard way to implement AI models in Unity. So you can integrate once and deploy on all Unity platforms. So yeah, so Sentis is open beta for all Unity users. Uh, it's going to be pre-release on Unity 2023.2, which is available today. And we're going to do a release version on uh, Unity 2023, also known as Unity 6 available in uh, June um, 2024. So I know we're over time, <laughs> but before you go, I'd like to leave you with a, with a final question. Can I write Newton's equation of motion with, tenses, with sentence tensor operators? The answer is yes. So since with, tensor, with sentence tensor operators, which can process a large amount of data efficiently on the GPU and CPU, in this case, we can simulate 3,000 stars incentives with just a few lines of code. So I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Sorry that we went over, and uh, we'll kick it off with a Q&A. Mm. I, I think we're out of time, yeah. but uh, if you have questions or want to chat with us, just come on up, and uh, we'll hang out for a while. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.